Hello everyone. So this video is saying um, RIP to the Reverend Father David Johnson, uh, who have just died this morning at three o'clock. I heard the lugubrious tidings a few hours ago from uh, from a mutual friend. So Father Johnson, he was 66 when he died. His December was sorry, it was sometime in December 1953 when he was born, and I happened to be at the Union Bar when he announced it was his 50th birthday. And there was reaching that, that milestone of a half century. There was no party, he hadn't organized anything. It was actually quite heart, heart, heart rending to think that's all he was doing, wasn't doing anything really, but with a bit of a yippee from him, this birthday. But it's his fault, he could have organized a party. It's not, not that he didn't have friends, but there we go. So um, I don't know what he died of, although he, did, had, he, he had difficulty swallowing someone told you he wasn't drinking like not even water a few days you would think he'd be drinking the hard stuff so father johnson he was a well-known specter in 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 uh, oxford for many years so i suppose i shall just uh, go into a bit of an obituary recount his life story but he was entertaining and bitchy in in equal measure he had he had a sharp tongue on him I was sometimes a, a victim of this, so um, this will not be an unmixed hagiography. There is a dark side to Father Johnson, that, that deserves to come out too. So um, he was born in Newcastle upon Tyne. His father was a junior civil servant, and he had one sister a couple of years younger than himself. So his father was English, his mum was Scots. He seemed to regard himself as completely English. And despite being a Geordie, he spoke in this um, rather advanced to receive pronunciation accent, very clipped. It seemed almost comedic. So he went to Dame Allen's school in Newcastle and he said, oh, I, I speak this way because my headmaster was Churchill's aide, aide de camp or something like that. Um, and that his mother taught elocution in the 30s. But it came, ac came across to others as aff an affectation. I know other people who went to Dame Allen's school, admittedly a generation after him, and they spoke with mild Geordie accents. So or was it put on? I suspect that it was. Um, just an invention for himself when he'd rather like to give the impression he came from a grander background than he really came from. Or he told me that when he was born, his father asked the doctor, does he have footballers' legs? And... Um, Father Johnson seems to have been a bit of a disappointment to his parents in that he certainly was no sportsman. Well, he wasn't ungainly, but uh, he was very short. He was slight. Um, he was he was no athlete. Um, but uh, obviously, a reasonably academic gift, academically gifted. He was brought up in one of those um, non-conformist churches. I can't remember which one, but he because I knew him quite well. I had lots of in-depth conversations with him. He switched from one denomination to another, and finally came to the Church of England and said it had um every, it had color and music and cheerfulness and everything that was positive. So he was attracted to the Anglican Church, and then he, that became his denomination for for the rest of his life. Um, anyway, so after Dame Allen's, he decided he would go to Cambridge. He applied to read theology, so he got in. He went to Selwyn, and he was the first member of his family to go on to tertiary education. His sister followed him a couple of years later, not to Selwyn, which is all boys in those days, I'm pretty sure. So he went up in 1973. I think in those days he had to take an extra year at school to apply to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and uh, he wasn't that scholarly, as I think he would be the, be the first to admit. Threw himself into the Oxford Union. It was the height of the Troubles. And one time he had to go to Cambridge Station to meet the Reverend Martin Smith, this Ulster Unionist MP, uh, bring him to, to, to the Union. The, Ox so the Cambridge Union is the debating society of Cambridge University, in case you don't know, because some people watching this won't be au fait with such things. Some of my ordinary viewers, not just friends of Father Johnson, shall be watching this one. Um, anyway, so he stood for the president of the Cambridge Union, managed to get elected unopposed. So he was at Cambridge 73 to 76, joined KUKA, Cambridge University Conservative Association, and he identifies a Tory for the rest of his life. Um, so uh, he told me so he told so many amusing tales about his time uh, as a Canterbridgean. Um, if you look up the Oxford Student and the Charwell, those Oxford University magazines from the noughties, he was featured in them. And the late Eddie Tomlinson wrote a piece there, an in-depth piece on the vicar. Uh, that's what we used to call Father Johnson. Uh, some some uh, prank of his. I don't know if it's true or not about saying that everyone had to give in a urine sample and leave it on the desk of the porter's lodge and tricking these um, undergraduates and freshers at weekend in, in doing that kind of thing. So he was always up to high jinks. Um, but anyway, he was elected on a post, president of the Cambridge Union Society, which was a major accolade because 
this is the playground of power and so many people who've, who've made their name there have gone on to achieve uh, great things in later life. For him, I suppose it wasn't quite to be. And uh, he was at Cambridge about the same time that Benazir Bhutto was in Oxford. He was there 73 to 77, if memory serves. And um, the, the, there's a, there are eight weeks at a term, both Oxford and Cambridge. And the last week of term in the, in the union in either Oxford or Cambridge is a farewell debate, which is a light-hearted one. There will be emotion, but they will do it in... Um, a humorous style like they might sing songs there'll be lots of in jokes will be sparsely attended and they'll be ripping shreds out of each other so and, and persiflage took place um in his time that was no exception one of their um uh, more charming traditions was, was to kidnap the president of the other place as in from oxford people drove over to cambridge and they kidnapped um father johnson he wasn't father in those days David Johnson on the street, but like with water pistols and bring him into the car and drive him back to Oxford where he'd be well treated, um, given lunch and um, uh, plenty of strong waters to wash it down with. And anyway, that evening, uh, the farewell debate as their prize, their captive, he was tied up, put into a supermarket trolley and pushed into the middle of the debating chamber as a bit of a climax to that debate, saying, we've got a prisoner, we've taken him hostage. He was released unharmed. And, I, the, uh, and then um, the, the Cambridge Union used to do the same to the Oxonian president. Uh, so what was it to be the next step? Well, he claimed that he'd be, he was told in advance he was going to get a 2-2. Two -two. There are only four people doing his course, and he couldn't fail 25% of the people on the course. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. I think a lot of these were tall tales, but he loved to spin yarns. So then he decided to be, he'd be, he'd be um, ordained and... Um, he, I mean, I'm not maybe I'm not remembering this properly because I first met him in 1999 and memory may uh, be playing tricks on me that um, he got his chaplain to write him a reference and his chaplain thought he was an absolute rat. But his chaplain hated Cuddeston, which is the theological college to which David Johnson was applying. So he gave him a glowing reference to get him in there that all the better with which to wreck Cuddeston. So he got into Cuddeston. So Cuddeston is um, uh, several miles outside Oxford. So he was there all boys college. Of course, it was not till the early 90s that um, women could be ordained at the Church of England. So he went there and told so many stories about it when they were saying grace at lunch that um, they would say, Dear Lord Jesus, uh, will thou ensure in thy eternal wisdom and loving mercy that the boys this college shall all be learned, wise and sober virgins through the grace of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, a learned, wise and sober virgin. Uh, Father Johnson could not be accused of any of those four things um, because he was a blatantly homosexualist in self-understanding from his earliest youth. Uh, I, um, I described him as a non-playing captain, um, but as a Ganymede, he was quite flamboyant. And he, he told a tailor there was some sort of um, fire-walking duty they had at Cuddeston. And down each corridor in Cuddeston, there'd be, say, eight bedrooms. So he'd think it'd be funny to ring the bell in the middle of the night just in case there was a fire. He, didn't, he knew there wasn't a fire, but as a trick. And so everyone had to get up and run out of their, 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 their eight bedrooms for eight undergraduates. Why is it there 12 people coming out of there? Because they've been bed-hopping and a lot of these guys are in bed with each other. I don't know how much tr how true that is. So obviously there were um, gay clergy in the Church of England, but in the 70s it's quite a different era. Um, it was only just been legalised, still regarded as unacceptable um, back then. It was highly controversial in the 90s. Only then could they be openly gay, some uh, Anglican uh, priests. So he already had a degree in theology and he had to spend two years there and then be a deacon. And that's a sort of, as I understand, that's a way station on towards being actually ordained. And then, yes, he was an Anglican priest. And then he was down in London in the early 80s. There was the Church Times, which is an internal newspaper for the Church of England. Anyone can buy it, but it's about ecclesiastical affairs. And this is a time when not the nine o'clock news started, the satirical news show. So he did something similar, um, not the Church Times, which was a takeoff of the Church Times. Um, and uh, then he worked at Church House, which is like the, the nerve centre of the Church of England. Not, not Canterbury Cathedral for worship, but this is sort of administration. And he said, and uh, he was someone who was not politically correct at all. So I have to invoke artistic license. I'm quoting him directly here when he said he was in charge of papes and nigs, as in um, relations with um, the Catholic Church and the black church, the black churches. Um, so he was there in the early 80s and then he was given a parish and he was in Leicestershire for some time. He loved being in charge there. Um, 
Yeah, but anyway, I, I was kind of wanted to expand on that earlier thing when I mentioned that he knew Ben Azebuto quite well, according to himself. And he's saying how he has photos of her wearing skimpy dresses, holding up a pint of beer, trying to get people to vote for her. I don't know, that's true. So then he, well, then he was in Leicestershire, and he ran his parish for a while, and saying to people, that's what I believe in, pointing to the cross, but it being accused of trying to pick up young men. So obviously he struggled with his dipsomania, eventually he had his driving licence taken away from him, because he's caught drink driving so often. But um, uh, I remember one time he said um, uh, that he invited... Um, J. Enoch Pearl to, 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 to preach in his church because J. Enoch Pearl was an Anglican in good standing. He was a, a fervent churchman, uh, not just a nominal Anglican, actually a church goer, uh, someone who was passionate about the church. And the church was packed, the only Sunday it was ever packed. He, he said that Father Johnson said he invited one of his other friends who was an MP to speak, said only five people turned up and three of them were the, my servants. Um, but anyway, claiming he was elated to have Enoch Pearl there. And then at dinner, because Johnson claimed to be a superb cook, he never cooked me dinner. He always promising that he would. He's not going to cook it now that he's dead. Anyway, saying um, he'd hired um, a cook and a butler for this dinner because he didn't want to miss, miss a moment of the conversation. And then um, he had Enoch Pearl's sermon recorded and he had his mother um, write it out in full. And when it was listening to the recording, there's not an um, not an uh, no hesitation or mispronunciation in, in the whole speech because as Enoch Pearl would say, well, how else is there to speak? Um, because he uh, was so fluent that he would never need to fill the space with any of these non-linguistic vocal sounds. Um, anyway, you see, I, I just do them all the time myself. I'm no Enoch Pearl in either sense, by the way. Um, so people thought that because it was Leicestershire and there's a significant Indian immigration into, into Leicester, that there might be some racialist tirade in the middle of his sermon, but there was nothing like that. Uh, but in the early 90s, um, really the solids hit the fan because his carousing was more than the Church of England could, could stand. And perhaps he's getting to the newspapers for all the wrong reasons. Uh, I, met, I met Alan Duncan MP for Rutland, which is very close to Leicestershire, and had known him because um, Alan Duncan had been uh, president of the Oxford Union in the late 70s, about the same time that uh, Father Johnson was, was in charge of the Cambridge Union. And he said, well, me and the Bishop of Leicester decided we had to give him the old heave ho be put out to grass because he looked at, b b at um, Father Johnson with exasperation, was really unamused by his antics, felt that he was bringing the church into disrepute. Um, so anyway, in 1995, Father Johnson was retired on health grounds at the age of 42. 42, I can see 42. You wouldn't get that now. What a generous package. And that house in Oxford, well, it's only had one bedroom. Did it have two bedrooms? I was in it a few times. Um, and uh, supposedly a handsome pension. No need to work. Wow. Wow, what a deal. Got to remember in the mid-90s, property was much cheaper than it is today. I mean, I don't think he owned it. Maybe the church owned it. But that was that health grounds was alcoholism they put him on courses to help him dry out but it didn't manage so whatever their talk about resisting um the temptations of the demon drink and then going to pub and this part was called learning to say no but the trouble is in every single pub in leicestershire i'd go in and before i could get close to the bar the bar was like all right same as usual father johnson pouring him a guinness extra cold because they would just know his order off like that because he was such a such a face such a bar fly so um that 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 did not succeed i said he wasn't going to go back to cambridge wasn't going to be a professional old boy oh right so he went to oxford which is totally different then there are similar as two different cities can possibly be and so uh, then he was a permanent fixture in the union bar for the remainder of his born days um and there was this he managed to have get a photo of the bishop who'd uh, forcibly retired him holding a pint and then uh, there's a quotation from the Bible said, David fled and made good his escape, as in uh, um, a mirthful reference to himself. So there was in father, there it was in Oxford. So you're an alcoholic and you've got all this time on your hands. What do you do? You go to the pub. Go to the pub. He did. He also had a hip flask. He didn't get many miles to the pint or, or, or to the dram, if you will. So he was on alcohol bans in various places. Guinness extra curled was his tipple. And then walking to Seaview Cottage, that was a 110 Hurst Street, Oxford. So he was going around in clericals and where the most old fashioned sort of clericals. Um, he really liked dressing up to the nines and Selwyn's summer dress, that, that blazer, that striped blazer and a boater like he wore it at, in Selwyn in the summer. But he never went on holiday anywhere. I'm not sure he'd ever been abroad, actually. Um, so going around by train or the Oxford tube because he couldn't he couldn't uh, drive. What else did he do? All sorts of lies, claimed that he was writing a novel. 
um, about um, some um, undergraduate at Cambridge in the 70s and whatever that freshers Sunday dinner, the big one, he's wearing some medal and someone says, how dare you wear the Victoria Cross? You're not entitled to that. He said, yes, I am, because uh, I was in Northern Ireland and I saved some child from the bomb. This is the 70s, so the height of the troubles. And that's how it begins. And I can't remember the rest of the novel. I don't think he ever wrote it. Or claiming in about 2002, he'd been offered some job as a as a clergyman in, in Switzerland. Some ski resort fell through at the last minute. We reckon it was all bull. Or another novel about uh, some uh, guards officer who then um, had a gay affair with his valet and was blackmailed about this, end up committing suicide. I don't think he ever put pen to paper. He did read us a poem he composed one time, and it was hilarious. It's about, um, well, I shan't say who, a certain president of the Oxford Union who was related to well-known novelist and judge about uh, masturbating with his old Radley and tie and things like that. Because I remember, um, who what was his name, the late um, uh, Noel Doherty listened to it as well, thought it was going to be absolute tripe, but in fact it was a hoot. Well, I wish that one was preserved, but they don't make them like Father Johnson anymore. They, they broke the mold when he was met, when he was made. But he could be quite cruel and very insulting to people, hit people when they were down. There was a bad side to him. He was selfish. He didn't seem to have any genuine Christianity. Some people remember acts of kindness from him, always asking people for loans and not repaying them. Um, so... Uh, yeah, banned from loads of pubs. One of them said he was dealing drugs. Well, I would accuse him of everything, including bubonic plague, but not drugs. I remember, you know, when he fell down and broke his leg and I pushed him to Royal Ascot. That's 20 years ago. My God, I could be I could go in as his wheelchair attendant, but I had to wear morning dress as well. And people saluting him because he was he was a vicar. So he was very un-PC. Um, anyway, uh, so sometimes he would be very dignified and well-dressed other times he'd, he'd you'd see him in the union bar about nine o'clock in the morning and there'd be like stale vomit encrusted on his jacket um and he would be um tetchy and perspiring profusely and you could see that, that something was really getting saying hello george how are you I i'm not feeling very well this morning like that and he had delirium tremens it with withdrawal symptoms because he hadn't had alcohol for about an hour he just couldn't cope with it. He developed such a dependence on, dependency on it. Uh, so he used to walk home. I only once ever remember seeing him eat lunch. Hardly ever remember even see eat dinner. So he was a member of Alka, according to himself as a reciprocal member because he was in Kuka. He wasn't really. But he used to go to all these Alka meetings. He had bugger all else to do. But I remember sometimes asking some MP something or other. But he was clearly quite pissed because it was about one o'clock saying, why don't you get these undergraduates to help you out they've got the time and it was painfully embarrassing to him listening like that so um i can't forget the very first time i saw him it was probably freshers week i was in the oxford union and i can't remember what the, the motion was something like the emergency debate something motion was something like um this house believes that student protest never changed anything and he came in and he made quite an entrance in his black clericals he'd like he'd step from the from the um, set of a period drama and saying, there was only one time in history the student protest ever made the slightest difference. It was in the 60s in the cinema when at the pictures they showed some uh, natives from Papua New Guinea um, rowing down a river and someone shouted, well, rowed Balliol, which is a well-known vignette. Uh, I'm not sure if it was ever true. And, and then and then, and then then he walked out. I thought, oh, who is that guy? I've got to find out who that is. So I met him and um, I, I can't remember my very first time I actually spoke to him, but I, I was staggered that he was swearing his head off. Head off. I couldn't believe that he was telling these crude sexual jokes. Um, so before I came up in 99, he supposedly had a gay liaison with a certain undergraduate. I better not mention his name. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Saying, you have made an old man very happy. I've woken up with a beautiful undergraduate and things like that. And said that this um, youth had lumpy sperm. But on other occasions, Father Johnson said to me, no, I don't have sex because it creates all sorts of petty jealousies and tensions and so on. Saying, well, you know, if you if you you sleep with someone in the same bed, you wake up in the morning and, you know, you wank him off and he wanks you off. That's a different matter and things like that. So um, that is Father Johnson. And I remember sometime one time I phoned him up. Uh, he did not knowing my number at this stage saying, is that the Reverend Father Johnson? I am Ayomide Akintunde. I am the Bishop of Benin City in Nigeria. I remember you from your time in church house in the early 80s. 
Now, Father Johnson, me and my good wife, Winifred, we are fecund, and the Lord Almighty has blessed us with a dozen children. Tell me, David, how many children you have now? David, you have no children. Why is your wife, is she barren? And things like that. And he fell for a hook, line, and sinker, saying, Why don't you come out to Nigeria? What are you doing right now? I'm retired on health grounds. We'll come out and then you can preach the gospel. There is a vast amount of money to be made in service of the Lord. Anyway, and saying, why don't we meet uh, We meet at the Randolph Hotel for tea tomorrow? Saying, well, you know, I'm rather short of readies at the moment. Okay, I'm on expenses. I will cover it. And then I and then I blew his cover. I can't remember how I took the piss out of him some of the time. Uh, one time I was, he was in the pub and I found up saying, um, uh, uh, saying um hello david I, I can't really do the voice anymore hello david it's rowan williams here you may know that i've not been happy with uh, uh the bishop of oxford for some time and i was going to go on to say i was about to point at bishop of oxford said well ha bloody ha or on another occasion when i found everyone saying um this is the holy father calling from home is when better the 16th was was pope and he had been in 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 in, in rome and he'd met john paul ii but didn't bow down to him who was that that guy um uh begins with a b a son beginning with a b who was that famous cambridge catholic uh, university chaplain uh never mind it'll come to me he was a half spanish one um and he'd known him quite well the one who was uh, more associated with peter house so he had so many tales he was a good friend of some a number of conservative mps he was not close to his sister or his two nieces um so he had a curious confection for millinery he organised a Millie Glindbourne at, uh, at the Oxford Union, sitting in the in the president's chair. Only about ten people turned up. Some people found him tiresome. And one time he was speaking at the summer debate in the Cambridge Union, he thought it would be funny to pour a glass of water over the secretary or things like that. So some people really didn't get the joke and found him annoying. And why is this man, who was in his 50s, trying to befriend undergraduates? I mean, like, was he buggering in them or something? No, I mean, no, he wasn't. And it would have been completely legal, legal if he was. So, um... Yeah, he was entertaining in small doses, but got to the stage that I'd heard every one of her, uh, his, his stories a dozen times over. Uh, so he was a bit bored, but much loose and frustrated. He worked as a tour guide for some time. He was in and out of hospital. In 2007, he announced he had pancreatitis. Now, you typically die with about five years of that. Did he really have it? I was never sure what to believe. So he was been in a nursing home in Abingdon since about 2013. I hadn't seen him for absolutely years. But he could be cruel to people, like insulting them about the birth of their children or things like that, or mocking people who'd failed things. So um, there, there, were, there was a bad side to him, definitely. I'm not pretending that he was all a good person that actually did things for other people. So he uh, was definitely different. He was um, a very uh, lively character. Um, yeah, he vivified uh, the Oxford Union, definitely. But he died in some ways a um, bored, frustrated and lonely old man. That is Father Johnson.